Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre. With your host, Lonnie Scott. Hey, gang, welcome to another episode of Weird Web Radio. In this episode, I'm talking to a very special guest, Kate Ferruler. This conversation covers quite a lot of ground that may be a little unfamiliar to all of you. I mean, after all, we did dig in a little bit into an article that she once wrote about human sacrifice, and I know for certain that I don't think we've really touched on that subject on this show quite yet. Kate is the author of an upcoming book, which I highly suggest that everyone go out there and pre-order. Go to Amazon and order Blood and Bones, Working with Shadow Magic in the Dark Moon. I don't think that this book is going to be quite like anything else out there on witchcraft that we've seen just yet. And we dig into quite a lot of the subject matter that she's going to be in on that book. Kate also has a store online called White Moon Witchcraft. And she supplies magical goods and gemstones and jewelry. And I I highly suggest that everyone get in the show notes, grab that link, and go check that out too. I don't want to take up a lot of your time, as you all know, the intros. I'm sure some of you even know by now to skip some of that stuff. <laughs> so, before you go, please consider becoming a member of Weird Web Radio. Every single supporter that I get helps make this show possible. So, without further ado, you know the drill. Please go to weirdwebradio.com and hit join the membership or go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio and only $5 a month will gain you access to all that bonus content that I cover with each and every guest. Sit back and enjoy the show. Remember to check out the show notes. Stay weird out there, my friends. Kate Ferruler, welcome to Weird Web Radio. It is an absolute honor to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's nice to talk to you. I'm glad we finally got the chance. Now, real quick, uh, have you been on any other shows before? Uh, never. This is my very first podcast mm-hmm. speaking anything. Woohoo! It's the main <laughs> voyage, folks. Let's take it easy on her. <laughs> yes, please. Please take it easy on me. <laughs> oh, that shouldn't be any problems at all. <laughs> all right, Kate. Um, I've noticed looking through, of course, your upcoming book and your social media and stuff that it appears that you, what you ultimately are practicing is a form of witchcraft. Is it fair to say that you identify as a witch? Yes, it is. Definitely. Okay. Now, when the word witch comes up in conversations, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people anymore. Uh, We don't always know right away when someone says they're a witch what that might actually mean. You know, there was a time 20 years ago or more that that probably meant Wicca. And I don't think that's true anymore, probably most of the time. What does the word witch mean to you? Well, uh, for me, I'm not uh, a part of any specific tradition. I'm completely solitary and have kind of intuitively found my way into witchcraft. Um, So to me, the definition of a witch is someone, you don't even have to, you know, study Wicca or paganism or any of that. There's someone who spends their life with a foot in both worlds, um, sort of deeply intuitive and can always feel the pull of the energy in nature and other people in the cosmos and in inanimate objects. Um, Basically someone who can feel this power and energy all around them and see the bigger picture of what our lives are and the cyclical nature of things. And at some point comes to realize that they can tap into this and use it in their life in the form of magic or ritual. Um, Yeah. Essentially, a witch is someone who is living authentically and truly through their heart more so than their eyes and ears and ego, I guess. Okay. Uh, you used quite a bit of information there that we're going to unpack a little bit. Uh, one key phrase you talked about was someone who uh, has a foot in both worlds. When did you f- know like your earliest experiences, when did you know that this was who you were, that you were a witch? Uh, I would say from the time I was really young, I was always interested in, you know, paranormal things and weird stuff and witchy things, superstitions. And I was always very fascinated with the idea of witchcraft. 
um, I started to notice quite young, probably like around 11 or so that I felt things more than it seemed other people could. And it was like, you know, when you meet someone and you can sort of feel what they're feeling, kind of empathy in a way, and you can sense things about people that no one has told you or things about a place. And that started pretty early on for me. Um, and from there, I developed an interest in um, kind of looking into that and using that in my day-to-day -day life and as a guide, sort of. Okay. It, you you say that you had this sense of other people and, and things like that. Um, what was your first experience of actually practicing magic? I mean, you, you talked about magic in your description of what witch meant to you. So what was your first experience that said that not only is this something that you could study or even intuitively find your way to, but convinced you that it's real? Um, well, huh, let me think. This is kind of a funny story that's a little bit silly. That's and perfect. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I had been, um, you know, reading about witchcraft with very limited resources. This was, you know, very early 90s, maybe even late 80s. And um, so I learned about puppets and, um, you know, using dolls and magic. And of course, most of the time back then that was associated with cursing and, you know, it was scary and you stick, <laughs> yeah, you stick pins in people. And so um, I was in probably like the sixth grade and I was sitting beside this boy who was like picking on me and picking on me. And I was <laughs> like, guess what? I'm gonna curse you because I'm a witch beat that and he's like you are not I don't believe you and the whole class got in on it and was like we don't believe you and then I was like oh <laughs> now I have to come up with something and I, and I said if you don't believe me then give me a piece of your hair and I'm going to put a curse on you and uh he was like fine here you go and he cut off a piece of his hair and gave it to me and everybody was like whoa you're in trouble now and <laughs> you know so I went home and <laughs> I made a doll out of wax and I put this boy's hair in it. Not really, you know, I, I did a little chant about like, leave me alone and stop picking on me kind of thing. And that was that. And the next day I went to school and he wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I was a little bit surprised. And that's when, you know, some of his friends were kind of like, oh, um, where is he? Like, he's not here at school. We don't, we don't really believe you. We don't believe you. And I'm like, I know, I hope it's, I hope he's all right. You know, <laughs> I, didn't, I just wanted to scare him. But in the end, he did come to school. He had, you know, he said that he had like a stomach flu and whatever, but he came to school later in the day. And I think what actually happened was he was scared to come to school <laughs> and after all. And then, um, so in a way, in a weird, twisted, very practical, ordinary, down to earth way, it kind of worked. Like he left me alone for that morning. He didn't come to school. <laughs> Oh, I like it. That that might be my favorite origin story I've ever heard. <laughs> so what happened to your reputation after that? I mean, you the, your social circle, the, the, your peers, the kids that are growing up with you as you get older, uh, they all probably remember the day you cursed that, pro, that boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. I think that I was always kind of like a weird kid. <laughs> Not necessarily in a bad way, but people knew like, oh, she she's a bit she's a bit strange, you know, and especially when I was really young like that and didn't have good resources to learn from, I would misunderstand things that I had read and talk about like having demons and stuff like that. And, you know, you and about... I were similar kids. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> good to know. I'm glad somebody was similar. It's funny. I was reading on your Pathos blog, uh, just looking through the different articles you had posted happy to find that you had more writing out there and uh, one of them that stuck out to me was when you wrote on human sacrifice recently it what i liked most about that <laughs> had people out there going what no <laughs> 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 was uh you talked about in the beginning how when you're a kid you loved horror movies all yes, sorts of things I, I was the same way i if it was going to be these big spooky cheesy 80s horror movies i was all in uh, but 
you said when it came to figures being sacrificed, you know, people being sacrificed in religious reasons, that it bothered you and it scared you. I'm exactly the same way. Even still today, the thought that a religious authority can decide that a human life has to be taken for figures and spirits and things that cannot be verified, and not not enough to convince me no, no, that's <laughs> that they're scary, right, scary thing. Uh, that, that that would be okay. I, I found that really cool that we had that in common. So what drove you to write that article anyway? Why delve into the history of human sacrifice? Um, well, I was reading some history about sacrifice, ritual sacrifice of humans and animals for research in my book. There's a little section in my book um, about sacrifice, and it touches on the history of live sacrifice. Um, there's nothing in there like, this is how you do it now. It's not like that, but <laughs> it touches on it touches on the history of it. A little duct tape um, and willpower and who knows. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so these, um, all of the information in that particular article was just things that I had learned while researching this topic that I thought were inter was interesting. And, um, you know, it was very strange to me how the idea of like sacrificing humans, although it was like long, 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 long ago, every part of the world did it. <laughs> it was like, it was a human thing that people did almost, I don't know everyone did it. It was like, you, nobody taught us. It was kind of like the way a spider knows to weave its web when it's born. This is something that humans did when they wanted something. And that's pretty freaky too. Yeah. There, there were some pretty disturbing practices in there. I read through the list. Um, I think people still do things like that today. You think of, of course, terrorist networks who sacrifice their lives in the name of their religion, but even beyond that, you have state-sanctioned human sacrifice in the form of executions of prisoners, death row. Uh, I that's true. I know. I didn't think about yeah, that. I I do not agree with the practice, but I know a small group of heathens in Oklahoma who like to stand outside the prison if they fire up old Sparky, as they say. I, I don't know if this is still going on or not, and dedicate that life to Odin. Uh, oh, pretty creepy wow. and disturbing yeah. practice. But I know there are people out there who still do things like this. Well, um, I didn't know that. I did not know that. And that I, I can see why I can understand where that comes from. I wouldn't partake in that personally. No, but I can <laughs> see where they're where they got the the idea of that. That's that's frightening. <laughs> it is frightening, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so. Let's move away from the more frightening ideas of sacrifice. Uh, sacrifice and offerings are a big part of modern practice. Uh, I'm sure it's a part of yours. What mm -hmm. What would you, uh, I shouldn't say what would you, but what are regular parts of your practice that you tend to go to for sacrifices or offerings? Um, hmm. I typically think in terms of um, my behavior it as sacrifice like I would um how do I explain this like do something for the greater good of myself or my family uh as a means of showing respect or um just as an offering to spirit like say to my ancestors my my grandmothers and everybody, I know that to them, family is really important. And they're, they were and are personally invested in my family and their grandchildren and all of that, even though they've passed. So for them, a sacrifice to them would be like thinking of how they would want something done in terms of like showing love to your children and encouraging them in a way that perhaps when they were alive, they weren't able to pursue or things like that. Um, but also in a more simple term, I will sometimes just, you know, if you're doing a small, simple ritual, I'll add a piece of hair and burn it on the candle as like part of me being kind of given to spirit or um, sometimes I'll use a little drop of blood or that sort of thing. So there's kind of a range. 
<laughs> I'm finding uh, hair being a common theme in your witchcraft all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, uh, and in fact, looking again through your like your Instagram page, especially, I've, I've noticed it seems that your practice, your witchcraft is very earthy. A lot of bones and skulls and things like that. And one of my favorite things I found was you were holding a raven or a crow's foot. And saying the caption says, you know, that this was killed by a hawk. And I hate how I have to explain that nature, things get killed in nature all the time. Yeah. How do you, I mean, how would you go about explaining that when people get concerned about seeing the skulls and things? Why are they such an important part of your practice? Um, well, the skulls and bones of animals, I feel um, one bone of one animal, say, say it's a cat bone or, um, yeah, let's, let's go with cat. It's a bone from a cat. So that has the DNA of every cat that's ever lived in it, but it also has the energy of every cat. So like sort of the archetype of cat, so stealth and um, grace and the things you would associate with qualities of a cat, right? Mm -hmm. So bones encompass like the full spirit of that entire species sort of. So I find bones of animals are a big part of my practice. And so are other, other animal parts like, like feathers and claws, fur. Um, now, these are not things that I kill or anything like that. <laughs> um, they're things that I find. And I don't know what it is, but for some reason, I seem to find dead animals more frequently than like anybody I know. <laughs> And um, other, also everyone who knows me knows that like when they find a dead thing, they're like, hey, give it to Kate. She likes those things. <laughs> so people will like give them to me as gifts, which sounds completely bizarre and awful. But, you know, my friend um, found a crow that had been killed by a hawk. And I was the first person he thought of to give it to, to, you know, clean and use the the pieces of it in my in my witchcraft. And um but yes, things definitely, they die naturally. We, if you just look around, you can see things die in nature all the time. And honoring something that has died naturally or even in an accident, which unfortunately involves humans like being hit on the road, you can still honor that creature by including it in your practice after you've cleaned it. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> no, that makes perfect sense. Um, I'm, I'm guessing most people don't know how to properly clean these things. We don't have to dig into all that practice. So uh, just if people are encountering dead things and they want to start uh, including them, as you've mentioned, uh, is, is there a place you could recommend people could go online or anywhere to learn about how to ha properly handle those animals? Well, and in my book that's coming out, I explain what to do. Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah. Briefly, I just, you know, some cautionary things. Don't approach an animal that appears to be sick or anything like that because they will attack you. Um, be very careful in terms of um, germs and bugs. Make sure that your skin is protected from touching those things. If something is really, really gross and it turns your stomach and you just can't handle it, leave it. Like, don't. This is, it's not like you have to incorporate this particular practice into anything. I know like, especially um, on Instagram with the witch aesthetic, there's a lot of bones and maybe people feel like they have to incorporate them in some way, but you don't. And also the other alternative if um, the idea of cleaning your own animals is, is gross. Uh, you can, <laughs> you can buy pre-cleaned animal bones online in lots of places. Um, I know that Etsy.com has a lot of sellers who find animals where they live and clean them and sell the parts. If you're concerned about the ethics behind where they get them, you can send them a message and ask about it. Some people are very transparent about where they come from. Um, so yeah, if you don't, if you don't find your own, you can buy them and not have to worry about the gross parts. Perfect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now your book of blood and bones working with shadow yeah. magic in the dark moon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please go out and pre-order this. It's available for pre-order on Amazon. Let's talk about that for a minute. Okay. 
Um, Why'd you decide that it needed to be written? Well, uh, the theme of the book is the dark moon, which um, is on calendars. It's the new moon, right? right? And there's talk of during the dark moon, it's kind of um, a time where people say, you know, just relax. Don't do a lot of magical practice during this time. Focus on divination and resting, which makes sense because sometimes the feeling that goes with that moon phase is restful sort of. But at the same time, it's also a very special energy that is just as useful as the full moon. It's just different. Um, it's a subject that I feel like it hasn't been openly discussed quite as much as, say, like full moon magic and that sort of thing. Um, the dark moon is linked to shadow work in that it's, it encompasses all of those endings and loss death, negative feelings, and um, letting go of things, facing your inner self and like fighting through the darkness, things that, you know, we all would wish we could just skip that part, right? <laughs> um, so I felt it was important to discuss that side of things, just because there needs to be balance. Um, not everything in witchcraft is is love and light. I mean, we know, but uh, yeah, I just think it's something that needs to be talked about in a, in a practical way that's not necessarily scary or power trippy, you know, like often when people discuss, like there's, I cover the topic of cursing, for example, and that automatically, I, I think of, oh, somebody's being petty or trying to exercise power over other people. So it goes into, on to discuss that deeper um, and maybe shed some light on that so people don't make silly decisions and, um, you know, and sort of just discuss things that we all have inside of us, but nobody really likes to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking here at the description of the book on Amazon and it says that, you know, you're... Uh, you're going to talk about ethically collecting using animal parts and bones. We sort of, we pretty much talked about that already, but then in uh, dark moon energy, we, you touched on that blood magic. How, why is blood yeah. important to your, your magic? I bet that's something that does frighten some people. Yeah, it definitely does. And you don't have to include blood in your practice. Of course, if you, if you don't, if you're not comfortable, then don't. Um, to me, my my blood is what is keeping me alive there's a lot of you know the history of the importance of blood in spirituality is really interesting it's always been considered um very very powerful um something like menstrual blood in particular is you know it has a history that it could kill crops if you if you, if a menstruating woman looked at a field of crops they would die and Whoa. dogs would be driven mad and you know but then on the other side it was like a symbol of um of life of birth of you know procreation so it's very loaded with polarized power you know what i mean um which makes it sort of like and, and the same can be said of ordinary blood, not just menstrual blood. Like it's a, it's a source of life. It's important. If you lose enough of it, you'll die. <laughs> um, there's, you know, vampires stories have been going on forever. Like people are really fascinated with blood and that's because it's powerful and it, in, it holds life. Um, so I just, you know, putting a little drop of your blood into a working connects it directly with like your very essence and your life force of who you are right now in this life. Um, like, especially if you're working magic to affect the world around you in a earthly way, you connect it to you either, you know, a piece of hair or sympathetic magic. I, I like to include blood in that sometimes, not all the time. <laughs> yeah. Totally understandable. It is, it fits very well with the uh, practice of witchcraft to get blood involved. Mm -hmm. People have tried to clean witchcraft, I think, a little much over the years. It's nice to see it get back down to some of its uh, more uncomfortable roots. Yeah, that's that's a good word for it. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, another description in here says it talks about dark deities. Who are they? Yes. Well, um, I touch on psychopomps mm -hmm. and um, gods and goddesses of war, um, destruction, uh, in terms of how these gods and goddesses apply to our everyday life. Um, if you're currently experiencing a dark moon phase in your life, you may be fighting through something, um, which, you know, you could learn about gods and goddesses of war and combat because you're trying to fight through something difficult. Um, and in terms of psychopomps who carry our souls into the next life, um, if you're encountering a time of transition, like one thing has ended and you're trying to begin something else, um, whether that's work or relationships or just whatever, um, a psychopomp can carry you from one place to the next. And um, so to speak, I mean, <laughs> and uh, so that's what I mean by dark deities. So like deities of death, psychopomps, destruction um some of them are are again a little bit frightening but once you learn how they apply to our everyday lives i don't think they're that okay scary as they sometimes have the rep for being <laughs> <laughs> no psychopomps are among my, some of my favorites to work with uh, i think you'll find a lot of the fans of the show will be happy to hear that you're talking about them in your book uh you also, or I shouldn't say you, the description says that you also uh, focus on uh, ethics, a strong focus on ethics. W what sort of ethics well, yeah. are involved in your practice? Well, um, just because a lot of the book talks about um, collecting animal parts. So there's ethics are really important in that, that you don't hurt anyone or anything. It talks about, um, there's quite a bit of talk of cursing, like I said, so you need to be aware that, you know, what you do affects everything around you. So don't, don't be a dick with your magic. Um, you know, be uh, ethics about how to decide, do you really need to curse someone? Or do you need protection? Do you need um, to look inside yourself and figure out, is it really all about you? Why you think this person is a problem? Um, what else? Well, in terms of using blood in your practice, um, there's ethics behind that. And like, you know, everyone needs to, if you're doing a ritual involving other people, obviously consent is very important. Um, and yeah, so I was just, when writing it, I was very careful to be sure to say, you know, be responsible in your workings and um, be, be ethical when you're using animal parts or bones or anything like that. What does your own daily practice consist of? Uh, for me, I have, it's, it's pretty simple and not that ritualized. I have an altar in my room that has um, some incense and some candles on it. And every day, I take time to sit at it and light the candles and just sort of absorb what I feel spirit is trying to tell me that day. So it's like, sometimes it's just simply relax, look out the window and absorb the feeling that's coming from the sky that day. Like what's the sky like? What's, um, what does the wind smell like that day? And get a feel for where you are earth wise. And also, Sometimes if I'm seeking guidance, I'll kind of go deeper into a meditative state and try to kind of receive information like what should I do about this and this. Sometimes I'll ask for signs for that day. If I'm dealing with something and I don't really know what to do, I'll ask, um, you know, for, for information to help me figure out and solve a problem I'm having. So, yeah, basically, I, I just it's kind of like I check in once a day <laughs> with the spirit world. And then that's that's about it. Yeah, Hey, nothing wrong with that. Uh, you keep you've talked about a couple of times um, spirit checking in with spirit and the spirit world and so on. Um, is 
and I guess in your book, you talk about dark deities and psychopomps, but is your practice deity focused? Or are you more, uh, are, are you more, I don't know how I want to say this. Let me start over. <laughs> I just, yeah. No, I know what yeah. you're saying. I understand what you're saying. Um, I'm not deity focused. I'm okay. not like I, I, uh, I, I have worked with some and I like to learn about it and read about it and get as much information as I can. But when it comes to my daily practice, it's definitely extremely like simple earth-based, like almost backwards, like very simple. Yeah. I get the stuff. idea looking at things that you've posted online that you, you are a very, you have a very animistic kind of practice. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, what is it that you're hoping to achieve? as a witch you've been a witch now for some, several years <laughs> if you got started in yeah. the late 80s early 90s hexing that bo poor boy into with his hair <laughs> uh you've been at it for a long time what is it that you're still hoping to achieve um i think that for me it brings me a sense of i guess peace and balance feeling like you can tune in with the energies of the world around you, other people, other things, and knowing that, and, and in some ways it gives you a sense of control over your life, honestly, if you're able to um, do ritual workings and ask, ask for guidance, that's helpful. If you're able to do spells asking, or like, you know, trying to say, um, attract money or, you know, it, it helps inspire you to take steps in your practical life towards your goals, but also kind of focuses your mind in a way that gets you goal oriented. So, but for the most part, I, it, it brings me a sense of balance and peace and a sense that I can make sense of the world around me. I'm not like just a feather floating in the breeze. Hmm. Like we have a say in what happens to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as a uh, thinking back over your years as, uh, as a witch, uh, what's been one of the biggest challenges in your work? Um, honestly, I, I've always feel like, uh, people don't take it very seriously and they think I'm weird, you know, <laughs> like when, when some of my, like, I, I don't, I don't hang out with any like-minded people really. Well, I have like a couple friends who, who are into witchcraft, but my family and most of my friends, uh, when it comes up in conversation that I wrote this book and they ask me what it's about, I'm just like, <laughs> uh, or, or they ask, you know, what do you do for a living? Well, I like, I have a witchcraft store. So when I say that to people, I tend to come across like a big silence from them, like what? And so then I, I stammer along and I try to fill the silence and it just gets weirder. So I guess, um, I guess the answer to that question would be um, feeling, feeling understood by other people or uh, I guess just being able to talk about it without feeling judged. I, a lot of it, I'm sure, is in my mind. Um, yeah, like, I don't know. People think it's weird. They don't get it. People in my own family, like much as they're happy for me. They, they don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get it. <laughs> no. How, I mean, okay. You brought up your family. Uh, I guess they're probably okay with you now or just like, don't, as you said, don't bring it up. Uh, but when you were young and getting into these things, did, was this a source of conflict with family? Uh, no, my, my parents uh, didn't practice any religion at all. So um, as far as they were concerned, they just thought it was silly nonsense. Okay, good. Now, yeah. So, any any witchy ghosty things <laughs> I was doing, they were like, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. At least you had that that freedom and that room to grow into it. And you've even gone into having your own store. You have a physical witchcraft themed store. Um. Well, it's an online okay. store. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought, wow, how this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> no no it's an online job <laughs> yeah okay um you know social media has become this big thing in our culture i've brought it up a couple times i researched you for the show by looking at your social media platforms and uh, the things that you've decided to share uh something that's gotten sort of 
popular and been a little bit uh, mixed opinions of it, and you've written about it, is this witch aesthetic that seems to be all over social media lately. And people have opinions. Mm -hmm. What's yours? I personally, I have no problem with the witch aesthetic. I enjoy the witch aesthetic. I know that it um, sometimes when something becomes popular, it can lose or we fear it can lose its importance and power and like sacredness. And I understand that. Um, at the same time, I've been around long enough to know that this has happened before and it'll go out of popularity again. Everyone will forget about it and it'll come back again as a fad later on in another like, you know, 20 years or something. Um, so I understand why people don't like the witch aesthetic because it does, it becomes about a look. It becomes about um, what, how good your pictures are and who can have the prettiest, witchiest pictures. And <laughs> instead of focusing on practice and learning and reading and um, you know, so I enjoy looking at the witch aesthetic pictures, but I understand the problem with it too. Yeah. So I guess that's how I feel about it. I don't feel personally attacked or bad about it, but I can see, I can see where that comes my, from. My favorite line in your article about it was that you're scrolling through social media, seeing these pictures and you feel like your chakras get aligned. <laughs> Just Yeah, totally. <laughs> They're beautiful. Yeah. I thought it was great. Yeah. I like the pictures. I don't have a problem with it. I, I, the, Hey, Anybody out there, if this stuff draws you in any way, shape, or form, if you find meaning in it, do you. Don't let people shut you down. Yeah. I don't give a shit. Be awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, but that does lead into one of my favorite topics from time to time. Thinking about uh, witchcraft and paganism as a whole, you know, from your viewpoint, what is really controversial? What do you think about it? Hmm. Well, that's hard to say. What is really controversial right now? Well, there's always um, the battle between like new witches and experienced witches. So you have a lot of um, people who've been, you know, people kind of around my age who have been, were part of the 90s resurgence of witchcraft and have kind of devoted our lives to reading about it and learning and people older than us too. And then now there's of course, another generation of young people learning and um, they bring their own ideas to the table. They have been brought up in a completely different time than us in a different way than us. Like they were born with social media, for example, and um, the way they learn and the way they express themselves is different. And I find um, there's a lot of push and pull between the two groups. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you call that controversy per se. I, it really bothers me when an experienced person cuts down a younger person for, um, like not knowing something or having less experience or doing something a new and different way. And, um, I think it's really important that we overcome that gap in, in people and between young and experienced people and we can both equally learn things from each other and yeah so that's a controversy that bothers me i don't like when people um like leave out someone because they're young or leave out someone because they're old mm -hmm. no i agree uh, that's that's a that's an important point to bring up uh what would you tell someone who was new coming into witchcraft, something that, especially if they're out there trying to learn all of this on their own, what sources or what resources do you think they should find? And sometimes I think most importantly, what should they ignore? Uh, well, I would say that although there's a lot of stuff on the internet, of course, that you can learn from, it may be better to um, start there, but then find books that delve deeper into the, each of the topics. Because I do find like on the internet, you can kind of get a beginner's rundown of so many things, but nothing that goes really deep into any one subject. So I would, you know, recommend searching out books and reading them, like really reading them. Uh, and in terms of things you should ignore, Ignore people who say that um, 
that's not a real witch. This is a real witch. <laughs> and if they say something like, well, you're not a real witch because you weren't, your grandma wasn't one or, you know, that sort of, well, I'm more, I'm witchier than you because I was initiated in this, this, and you weren't. I think you should ignore that. I don't kind of prescribe to that thinking. Not that there's anything wrong with initiation. If that's the path you end up taking, go for it. But I don't think you can define witchcraft for other people. So find your own way. If someone is, you know, criticizing you and setting off red flags and being holier than thou, distance yourself from that and just continue to learn what you're interested in and find your own way. Well said. Uh, have you trained other people over the years? I mean, before this, you thought about writing a book. Have you like gotten involved with groups or individuals that you've taken on as students and taught them your practice? I never have. No. Ah. Um, my path has been extremely solitary and personal and I, I, I do tend to keep to myself. I've never done, I've never even been part of like a group ritual or a coven or anything like that. It's all been very like all alone. It's very, <laughs> um, but I like it that way. I'm not, I, I don't know that I would be a good person to teach others in person the idea of, um, you know, doing a workshop or something like that is really kind of intimidating <laughs> to someone as introverted as me. Um, so, no, no, I haven't. It's not that I never would, but it's not something I think I want to get into. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, a lot of people have aversions yeah. to groups. I, I spent a long, long, long time mostly working by myself. And even now, mo the bulk of my practice is solitary. But I am part of larger organizations and uh, groves and kindreds and things now too. And group ritual has a different feel than the individual space. That's for sure. Yeah. Like I would definitely, it is something I want to learn more about and try at some point. Um, I, there's definitely got to be things to gain from that. And I do want to have that experience, but um, just I, my life doesn't involve a whole lot of other witchy people. It just doesn't. <laughs> I suspect when this book hits bookshelves everywhere and then and the reviews start pouring in, uh, you're going to find yourself being invited to some things that maybe you weren't before. Well, we'll see. <laughs> that would be cool. I yeah. don't know. I'm in Canada. I, so. I, I, yeah, a lot of the big festivals seem to be in the USA. And um, so, you know, traveling is, is its own hurdle in and of itself. But we'll see. Maybe. That's right. Listen up, folks. If you want Kate at your event, and I think you should, uh, you're going to have to pay her travel expenses. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome her. Make sure she feels uh, safe. Uh, <laughs> and she'll teach you all about using the, the dead animals behind the hotel before the seminar yeah. starts. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go scrape up some roadkill. Come on, guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> roadkill sorcery. Yep. One on one, I like it. <laughs> uh, around here, it's just a, a bunch of squirrels. Yep. <laughs> um. Now, every place around has its own uh, unique history to it. it, whether it's haunted places, witchy people who lived in the past that were there, landmarks of significance and power. Thinking about where you've lived uh, over the years, any place you've ever really lived, what's What's one of your favorite pieces of local folklore? Who? Well, I don't know that there was a lot of local folklore where I live now. I know that um, growing up, I grew up kind of in the country outside town, and there were places all around that I felt were powerful, if that makes sense. So it's not really local folklore, but it's places that I felt were some, for some reason there was something different about those places and something magical about them. And one of them was um, across the road where I grew up where were train tracks and they were situated in such a way that they were at the bottom of a ravine. And um, so if you were on these train tracks, you were hidden from view. And um, I consider train tracks kind of a, um, a way of transferring energy, right? Because it's, it's like a road taking one thing from one place to another. So I used to go and do 
rituals and spells by these train tracks. And I had a feeling sort of like, in the same sense that a crossroads is important, I felt like these, these train tracks are important. So I don't know if something happened there or just because they'd been there for so long or because they carried energy from place to place, but I just felt like it was a really powerful conduit spot for magical work. Um, that's not really what you asked me. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> hey, there's perfect. not really a lot of folklore yeah. where I came from, to be honest. Is there folklore somewhere that really attracts you, a place that you'd like to visit because of the story attached to it? Oh, tons. Um, all of the all of the usual places that witchy people want to go. I'd like to go see the stone circles and Stonehenge. I'd like to go to Salem. I would like to, um, oh, I don't know, anything like that. Any kind of, or even any kind of uh, big religious place, like pyramids and things. I'd like to go to all those places and see how they feel when you go in. You know, they feel different because they're, um, have been a place where so much religious stuff has happened or spiritual stuff has happened. Uh, but as of right now, I've never actually done much traveling. Um, a friend of mine went to Salem and brought me back all these really cool like trinkets and she had the best stories and she saw so many awesome things and these great pictures. I was like, ah, oh, why can't I go there? I mean, I guess I could go there. So maybe, maybe I will. Yeah, you could go there. Yeah. It's not far from Boston, fly into Boston take the ferry down to Salem or drive down. I've been to Salem. It's a, it's a cool town out in Massachusetts. In fact, um, Matt Oren, I believe lives out there and does professional readings and such in the area. You could uh, hit him up and hang out with him for a while. Yeah. No, it'd be, it'd be great to go to Salem. So that's on my bucket list, I guess. Yeah. Everyone should go once. It's a great time. I highly recommend it. Uh, and I'm sure the city's only getting better, uh, at least catering to the the witchy and more occult crowds because more and more more and more of us are moving there. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Maybe it'll become like you know, we're, we're all going to end up there. It'll be the witchiest place on earth. Uh, certainly in the United States, although I think uh, Minneapolis St. Paul would argue with that. They 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 seem to think that they've got that moniker. Uh, you brought up railroads mm-hmm. as this place of power and trans transition of energy and things and i i really like that you mentioned that i don't think railroads get enough attention as things like that i the town i live in has it grew up out of railroads in the pre and post civil war era in the united states and if not for the railroads this this community wouldn't even be here and there's a lot of power where they both used to be and still are uh, it's nice of you to bring those up and recognize that. Yeah, I have a preoccupation with them and with the, uh, you can find interesting rocks and slag all around them that, you know, I keep and bring home. <laughs> I'm I'm one of those people <laughs> who picks up rocks and interesting objects and brings them home. And now there's a pile of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm sure you're the one that, that, that brings a lots of interesting things home based on using uh, dead animals and bones and things in your practice and rocks and things from the railroad. Yeah. I'm sure you've got quite the collection. I do. <laughs> yeah. If a crow is not your spirit animal of sorts, I don't know what would be. <laughs> no, I, I love crows. I definitely have an affinity with crows. Yeah. Now there's a part of my show where I like to get into uh, a range of questions that don't usually get asked from occult practitioners. Although now in my fourth season, I think I'm starting a trend out there a little bit. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> uh, Kate, have you ever experienced a haunting? I have not. I um, no. No. And you know, I've always felt kind of like when it comes to paranormal activity, I must be like ha- be thick skulled or something. Because it always seems like <laughs> everyone else experiences these crazy things and picks up on spirit activity. And I am just like, doo, doo, doo. and uh, for a long time, I kind of felt jealous of those people. I'm like, wow, you have so many, like my one friend, the one who went to Salem, everywhere she goes, she has these strange paranormal experiences. Where, like They follow her around and I'm like jealous of her. But at the same time, a lot of them are frightening, you know, and So I'm sort of like, I'm kind of glad I don't when I really think about it, because some of the things that people have told me about just sound scary. They're afraid to go home because there's a ghost in it. And, uh, Hmm. you know. 
Now, if any of those people asked you for help, they know you're a witch, they know you're into all this different stuff, what would you do to help them? Uh, well, I would um, maybe explain to them how they could cleanse their space and um, how to perform a ritual room to room to banish any en entities that they would like gone um, and do a, like a cleansing as needed. Sometimes you know, you can, burning things, of course, I like to burn bay leaves to cleanse the space. Um, but when it comes to like a really severe haunting, I'm not the right person to ask because that's just not the realm of my experience. No, I, I can imagine you uh, missing an opportunity here to go find the, like a supernatural episode, go find the bones of the person who's haunting the place. Yeah. And it burned the bones. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thinking back over again, you know, your time as a witch and the things that you've done. Um, is there something in the recent years, maybe the last four or five or six years that happened uh, that changed a core belief or turned you in a new direction? Um, well, uh, it's not a cheerful topic, but um, having people, older people in my family, as well as not so old people in my family pass on, um, being with them as they transition from this life to the next really just rocked my life, like not in a good way, but um, made me change my views on life and death in general and the cycles of things. Being close to someone that you care about as they pass on and walking them through that and comforting them through that experience. If you have the chance, um, is it, I just came to realize like they're not gone when they pass away. It's like, they just transform. They go somewhere else because I can still, you know, my, both of my grandmothers and my mother, I don't feel, I guess like an atheist would feel like they're just gone and that's it. Whereas like watching this happen and experiencing this, I'm like, they're not really gone. They've just changed form. They're not here anymore. But it, it just blew my mind and made me realize that we have many lives, I think, not necessarily on earth. Like we don't know what is out there, but it's bigger than we are and it's real and people don't just disappear. Was there something that you actually experienced, something that you could share with us in detail that, that made you start to feel that way? Honestly, it's just a deep sense of knowing, almost comforting. When um, like during the grieving process, I was like, no, like I can still feel these people with me. And I know, like, I just know that, they're not gone. And that's the best I can explain it. It's just a deep knowing. I wish I could explain that's it better. Fair. Yeah. I. No, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, that's a difficult subject sometimes. Um, and I know that your book talks about it a little bit. I saw in the description of helping loved ones cross over and I'm glad that you touch on that subject. Um, and thinking of books, you know, we're nearing the end of the regular part of the show, but thinking of books, you're an author yourself is there, is there a specific book? I know you largely have followed this intuitive path of witchcraft, but is there a book perhaps that shaped your path as a witch or directed you more than any other? Well, um, being a, let's see the first, actually the first book I found about witchcraft that was, um, had good information in it and really just struck me in the heart was, um, witches by Erica Zhang. And it's this big hardcovered book with illustrations by an artist named Joseph A. Smith. And what got me about that, first of all, I was quite young when I found it, but it's the illustrations are just haunting and fascinating. And it has um, like the book itself talks about witchcraft from a feminist perspective. Um, but it also has poetry about the mandrake and baneful herbs and these like it is just the whole book itself is this amazing work of art, the writing and the 
illustrations. So although it doesn't say to, you know, it doesn't have instructions on how to do things, it's brilliant and beautiful. And I was just obsessed with it when I was a kid. I took it out of the, the town <laughs> library probably like 50 times, you know, and um, I have a copy of it. I bought my own eventually as I got older, but yeah, that's a good one. That's cool. Did the library eventually just give you the you book? You know, they really should have. They should have just <laughs> just taken pity on me and been like, that kid's, that's a weird kid. Just give her the book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. We're getting near the end of the regular part of the show. Is there something that I should have asked you or something you'd like to talk about that I didn't cover? Or do you have any parting thoughts that you would like to share with the audience? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big one for speaking. I'm more of a writer than a talker. Um, <laughs> so no, I can't really think of anything to add. All right. That's perfectly fine. Where can people find you and your book? Okay. Well, my book, um, of blood and bones working with shadow magic and the dark moon is available on Amazon and at Llewellyn and eventually will be at, um, Indigo. My website is whitemoonwitchcraft.com. And that's my store. It's also, there's blogs on there and writing. Um, mostly that's my storefront though. And then on Instagram, it's white underscore moon underscore witchcraft. So that's where I am. Perfect. And before I let you go, uh, there's one more thing I wanted to ask you about. Mm -hmm. Runes. Yeah. I've noticed that runes are a big part of your practice. They're an enormous part of mine. How did you get yourself interested in runes? Honestly, I um, they were one of the first, um, I guess, like oracles or divination tools I, I had. When I was about 14 years old, a friend took me to a psychic fair. And um, I had birthday money and I was so excited to be there and I bought a bunch of stuff. And one of the things I got was a, a set of runes made out of ceramics. And um, as I started to read about them, they just really resonated with me, these simple symbols. They're so simple and you can see them everywhere you go, almost like omens, you know, because they're so, there's just these simple lines and um I eventually learned about bind runes and things like that. I created, um, when I was wanting to start a family, I created a, um, a bind rune and had it tattooed on my stomach as like protection and health and new beginnings. And, you know, started a family. When I started a business, the same bind rune symbol is my business logo. And yeah, they're, they're, they're a part of my life for sure. That's great. Yeah. I love seeing runes being part of anybody's life. So well, they're everywhere. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. I was recently interviewed on Gifts of Weird, uh, hosted by John Hyatt, and we talked quite a bit about runes. And that's something I mentioned that you can just go walk in the world and look for the rune. Yeah. You know, you'll see them. It'll tell you something <laughs> about what to expect yep. or what's going on in your life or mm -hmm. definitely. Yep. Well, Kate, it has been wonderful talking to you. Thank you again for taking the time out to be here. Um, everyone out there, now you know where you can find her. You know where to find the book. In case you're wondering, I have pre-ordered the book. I am really excited to read this book. <laughs> go pre-order it now. The more pre-orders that go into a book, especially in, on the Amazon system, uh, the higher they come up in search rankings and the easier it is for people to find it. So help Kate <laughs> uh, get this book into more and more hands out there. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. And thank you for talking to me and having me on. You're, you're welcome. All right, gang. Now, you know how this is going to go down. We're going to go into the Patreon bonus extended interview. If you want to hear what she has to say about the even weirder shit we're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have to go to patreon.com slash weird web radio or go to weird web radio.com click join the membership remember it is only five dollars a month five dollars a month less than you probably paid at starbucks today to <laughs> join the membership and get access to a lot more cool information stay weird out there my friends okay kate it is bonus audio time are you ready okay I like that. You're just I guess. Really ready. I, don't know. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? Um. Do you want to hear how they just answered that question? What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? 
that and many others, including what they think about the afterlife, what they may or may not do in cemeteries, what are their traditions and magical practices that have to do with the dead, folklore that surrounds their homes, and so much more, available for only $5. $5 a month. Even if I make more than one episode in a month, it's still just $5 a month at patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership you can find me on instagram at weirdwebradio you can find me on facebook as weirdwebradio or come join the new fun and exciting weirdwebradio facebook group thank you again for being here stay weird out there my friends (laughs) 